Yeah. Right, shall yeah. I let them in? Yeah, go on. Let them in. Okie dokie, here they come. Hello, hello. <laughs> it's Roger, as per usual. <laughs> of course. <laughs> hey, Roger. Anything all? Was that, was that Stop it. Yeah, I'm coming with you on now. <laughs> How you doing? How you doing, folks? All right? Yeah, thanks. Good. This video is being recorded. Mm. All right. Get the right camera, my help. Oh, you don't have to be on camera if you don't want to, obviously. <laughs> How are folks doing anyway? Enjoying your freedoms? A little bit? It's, look it up. Look it up. <laughs> bit, hot, bit hot today, though, Dave. That's at the end, Roger. That's at the end, not now. I know. The picture behind me was from last night, from the garden. Oh, yeah. oh nice. I I'm going to have another go tonight, see if I can get a better uh, composition. What time did you have to stay up for to get the dark sky, Roger? Uh, well, I only I recorded it from half eleven to right. about half past three when it just got too bright. Okay. <laughs> so it was it was still taking photographs when I got out <clears throat> this morning. But so you're tucked up in bed, in other words, then. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell a man who doesn't have to get up for work, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> and I did a sequence from all the stills, so that came out quite well. Oh, that's well. good. Oh, I like see that. A amount of satellites that were up there. Yeah, isn't it? Almost like a sky train effect. Are you, you going to show some next week, Roger? If, well, I might show you it in two weeks' time. Or oh, two weeks, sorry, yeah. The next <laughs> meeting, anyway. The next meeting. The end of term party. The end of term party. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Roger, have you got the technical details of what you took there, please, mate? Right, okay. So I used my little Fuji mirrorless camera, okay. which has got an APS-C sensor and a uh, Samyang 12mm manual focus camera. Okay. So I just fixed it on the tripod, static position, and just let the camera stay still while... All the pictures moved past. And yeah. then I picked this one out of all the ones that I did take. There were about 800 or so. Yeah. And uh, I just adjusted it in Photoshop. Okay, mm. that's, that's just one picture, is it? One's... That is just one picture. It's not wow. a stack or anything like that. Yeah. I've, uh, I've got a little bit of pollution down in the bottom here. But that's just from the uh, row yeah. of houses that I've got down behind me. If I go about half a mile out of the village yep. that would be dark what sort of exposure mm. times that uh that was 20 seconds at 1600 iso okay yeah i keep trying mm. went all the way down to Pemberley, down near eastbourne all right on the beach and got my camera all set up just cloud oh, oh, oh no uh, going back in two weeks' time, so I'll give it a try. Yeah. Excellent. Talking about clouds, it's time for noctilucent clouds, of course. I saw yes, the first absolutely. one two or three nights ago. Yeah. Very low down in the, the north. Yeah, yeah Mary McIntyre has seen some from her place in Oxfordshire. Yes, that was the same night, I think, mm. 29th. But it was quite faint, about 11 o'clock at night, um, summertime. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. Anybody else got anything they'd like to say before we get cracking? I just say that I am very interested in space flight and I've been since before the moon landings and I watched all 135 shuttle missions live on the TV or over the internet or caught up in the news and I've been over at the Space Centre quite a few times and I did manage to see two launches, STS-59, the Space Radar Lab, and STS-89, both Endeavour, that went to the Mir Space Station. And what I do is I record that video and I do lots of record space missions. That's my kind of hobby. And I'm in Dundee in Scotland. Fantastic. Welcome along, Robert. You're in good company anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellent. You'll be answering my questions at the end then, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a question from Keith who asked about Deep Sky from his suburban garden. 
Uh, IDAS light pollution filters D3, are they worth the money? It, a lot depends on what camera you're using and what your light pollution is, because different filters filter out different wavelengths. Because with the uh, with the LED lights that they're bringing out now, they broadcast over a wider spectrum, so you're getting more difficult to filter those out. Is anybody using any filters that they'd recommend? I use I use the Duo ones. I use STC uh, Duo by filter, whatever it is. I never I don't change it at all now. No, it just stays on all the time. I th because you can shoot when the moon's out. Light pollution is not a problem. If you learn how to process by color images, you can reproduce anything you want anyway. I must admit, RGB seems to be a, a even though I'm using one shot color cameras, just seems, a, I don't know, didn't well, it, seem to didn't rock my boat anymore. <laughs> yeah, Dave, are you able to uh, pop a link into the chat so people can have a look at the filter you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Right. Okay, I'll keep right. I'll go through my little bit then. Um, so yeah, great to see all these pictures appearing on the Padlet. Good to see Lee is getting out there practicing for the eclipse, the partial eclipse that's coming up, and a few planets as well. So good stuff. And of course, the Milky Way from Sandy and uh, Roger as well. Um, thanks very much for all your donations, Roger. We had uh, another donation today. It sounded like that was from a pirate, according to the message that came with it as well. But uh, what? yeah, got it. <laughs> of course, there are, other, there are other meetings um, Monday and Thursday evenings. Um, Pete Williamson has got his Astro Radio Reach Out and Touch Space at 8 p.m. on those days. And if my mouse works, yeah. And on Stargazers Lounge, they've got the Stargazing. I know they haven't had one for a couple of weeks, and I think they're now deciding where they go now the lockdown is sort of ending. And I think they, they were talking about perhaps changing the day as well, but I'm not 100% sure yet. But that was Sunday evening at 7.30, but I'll keep you uh, updated as I find out more. Okay. And Mike, would you like to talk about some of your meetings? Go Space Watch. Yeah, um, can do. Yeah, uh, we've got uh, tomorrow night. We've got Stephen Eisel from uh, Virgin Orbit um, uh, giving a talk about, about Virgin Orbit. Uh, that's uh, tomorrow night at seven thirty. And in two weeks after that, uh, we have um, spaceflight author Ben Evans uh, with a talk on an experimental flying machine, um, all about the space shuttle, which uh, uh, will be. Uh, might be similar to tonight. <laughs> so I uh, think it might be an extension to what. Okay. I, what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> and on um, Wednesday, the seventh of July, we have uh, Igor Bobek from Croatia talking about the Mars, the Mars Society. And on the twenty-first of July, we have Andy Briggs uh, from Spain on how to photograph a black hole. So that's what we've got coming up. Excellent. Good. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Okie dokie, and um, what else? Uh, yeah, all these dates I do put on the Sky Diary. So if you go to star uk forward slash diary, and there it is, you've got the three. The blue one is the events in the sky. The red one are all events like Mike's, Go Space Watch, Reach Out and Touch Space, etc. And the Virtual Club, uh, Astronomy Club as well. And the black ones are um, notable space anniversaries and things like that. And thanks to Steve... Tonkin and Phil for uh, helping me fill those in. And Phil's been quite busy over the last couple of weeks, haven't you, Phil? I've noticed. Yes, yeah, so I've uh, scoured Eventbrite, put some lots of ones stuff in as well. There. So, yes. Yeah, so go to star starhyphengazing.co.uk forward slash diary, download the Team Up app, and you can carry it around with you. So, yeah. And of course, two weeks' time going forward, 15th of June is the end of term party. So any suggestions, uh, Chris has offered to do a talk, uh, a quiz for that. So if you've got any other ideas you want us to uh, do for the for that, then uh, throw your suggestions forwards. Um, 20th of June, so we're not stopping completely. Um, International Sundays on the 20th of June. And I'm taking part in a joint event with Stargazers Lounge and Go Stargazing All About the Sun, obviously. So during the day, it's all more family-orientated talks. 
and in the evening it's more for um amateur astronomers so uh i'll post details of those on the web page as i get them in and the diary of course so july and august we're having the rest of the summer but the next meeting will be on the 28th of september where we sit down and have a talk about what we're going to do going forward now things are unlocking and stuff like that but look out for more pop-up gastro pubs and uh, i should get some time to be able to organize one or two of those throughout the summer so have a look out for that and if you have subscribed to the vac meetings if i do organize one <laughs> i will send an email out to everybody to say i'm gonna hold one so go to the virtual astronomy club webpage and fill in the form <laughs> add your name and you'll be emailed when there's an event taking place and then later this year i thought we might do some more practical sessions so if you've got any suggestions or questions for that um, or anything you want to contact us about just go to star gazing.co.uk forward slash questions and you can submit a question and we'll add it to the pot and uh, yeah so just throw your suggestions in folks and then later this year got the equinox sky camp which i believe is going ahead at kelling heath in norfolk it's going to be there from the 7th to 10th of october so if any of you are around it'd be great to meet up with you so uh let's hope we can okie dokie well tonight's meeting is philip price who's going to be talking about the history of the space shuttle so uh whenever you're ready phil if everybody else can mute for me please <clears throat> okay right well good evening everybody um as you can see on the flash on the home page the space shuttle's kind of celebrating a poignant year this year um in 1981 so it's the 40th anniversary of its launch which happened back in april and 2011 uh, it was decommissioned which happened the end of july or mid to the end of july so we are bang in the middle of those two anniversaries. So what I'm going to do this evening is just to remind everybody what an amazing feat of engineering the Space Shuttle was. Uh, bring back some memories for a few people uh, or for people that aren't familiar with the Space Shuttle, then introduce it to them. And hopefully try and teach everybody at least one thing they didn't already know, which uh, may be a little bit more challenging for some people than uh, than it is for others like our friend in Dundee might be teaching me a few things after it. So here we go. <clears throat> this is the order of the day. So I'm going to take you through the story behind why the Space Shuttle uh, was um, uh, developed in the first place and how it became about. I'm going to take you through the Space Shuttle fleet and what it's made up of. We're going to go through the launch of a Space Shuttle, what it achieved. We're going to come take you through a Space Shuttle landing and then the end of an era when it was decommissioned. So the origins of the Space Shuttle then. So our story goes back to the late 1960s or the mid 1960s, even before man first landed on the moon, when the question was asked, what is NASA actually going to do when they finished the Apollo? Now, the obvious answer would be to go to Mars. And I'm glad they didn't do that because I think that might have overshadowed the Apollo mission and we may not even have had the Apollo mission. But the answer that they gave is they wanted to do loads of low Earth orbit stations. So they had one going around the, uh, uh, the Earth, one going around the moon. They'll have some space tugs that can uh, change, the, put them into different orbits. You'll have uh, nuclear shuttles that can go backwards and forwards between the Earth and the moon and eventually onto Mars, which they planned for 1983. And then you'll have this, the space shuttle that would ferry things up and down to these stations themselves. But then things didn't go well financially. For America, the euphoria of uh, 1968 was followed by budget cuts. Uh, the Vietnam War hit, which um, hit them heavily financially. The Great Society budget deficit. Now the Great Society was a scheme by, done by Lyndon B. Johnson back in his 1964 election campaign, where he tried to um, fund some of the poorer families within the US uh, and th that then needed uh, to have some extra top up. 
There was the oil crisis of 1973. That wasn't just an American thing. That was a global thing. Uh, and Nixon himself wasn't a big supporter of um, space. So the actual manned spaceflight budget was cut in from 1966, when it was 3.8 billion, to 1.78 billion in 1972. Now, that's quite a considerable cut when you, you, you could take into account inflation as well. So in the 1970s, the plan changed. The shuttle became the priority. It's because NASA needed to do something. And in order to do all of these other bits that could come later, they needed to be able to travel backwards and forwards to low Earth orbit to be able to start and, co and continue what they were doing. <clears throat> so they cancelled Apollo. I believe there was 20 Apollos at the time, 20 had already been cancelled, and then they cancelled 19 and 18, so they only did the 17. They was planning on doing a second Skylab. Um, that concept was built, and you can see it on display here at the uh, National Air and Space Museum. Um, there were no tug or nuclear stages, <clears throat> and the Mars program was cancelled. Well. I wouldn't say it was cancelled, it was just deferred 50 or 60 years is the way I'd like to put it. Um, and the industry, the people working, was cut from 400,000 people to 150,000 people. So that's quite a chunk and quite a setback for, for NASA at the time. So they were left with building and developing the shuttle, which they started to do in the 1970s. But they still had this money problem because they'd had their uh, manned spaceflight budget cut. So the military came along and said, do you know what? If you design some of the specifications that we need, we can help you have some of our military budget for it. So some of the things that the military asked for was they wanted the payload bay increased from fifth, uh, to, uh, 15 feet to 60 feet. So originally it was going to be 40 foot. They increased it to 60 foot. The 15 foot was the set diameter because that's what they wanted um, uh, space stations to be at. That was a, a, a recognized uh, diameter to be able to live in. But the 60 foot was because some of the military satellites were that big and they wanted to be able to deploy and collect those from low Earth orbit. They needed a reusable thermal protection system. So some of the existing ones, or like Mercury and Gemini, they use the bladed ones where once you've um, come through the atmosphere, it's very difficult to reapply the coating. So they needed something that they can use over and over again to make it cheaper so they didn't have to build a brand new spacecraft each and every time. And they wanted two fully recoverable uh, stages for this. So if we take each of those points individually, um, the cross range needed to be 1500 uh, miles cross range. The reason why is when you leave from a point on the Earth, you go round one orbit and come back to the same point, the Earth has rotated and that rotation is 1500 miles, which is exactly why they wanted to be able to go cross range to be able to make up that distance so that they could deploy or collect satellites um, in one orbit. So one of the concepts that they used, they, they'd already had the X-15 and they got the X-20, which hadn't flown. It was a concept model called the Dinosaur. Um, and it had delta wings, the triangular wings that you see on the side. So that's the concept that gave the uh, shuttle its recognised uh, wing configuration so that it was able to do this 1500 mile cross range. And in terms of thermal protection system, they came up with the idea of using silica tiles. So they were 90% air on the inside, um, but they could uh, shed 95% of the heat and absorb the other 5%, which means that they could use them over and over again. And in terms of reusability, the first part that they wanted to reuse is they wanted to make sure that the um, the astronaut stage came back down. The second stage, the second idea that they wanted to do was to have reusable rocket boosters that could fit onto the side and then they could be parachuted down into the ocean and collected. But once the um, solid rocket boosters had been um, 
been ejected, they needed something to uh, a fuel tank system to be able to allow the uh, shuttle main engines to carry on their work. So they came up with this, an external tank that was then added to the back of the shuttle that could then supply the main engines with the fuel that it needed to carry on its um, trajectory into space. And this was uh, ejected, uh, broken up and ended up in the ocean. So in terms of development and testing, they, when they came back down, they've had no, they've got no fuel, so they had to come down with no engines. Once it's done with the orbit burn, it would glide back down because there was no storage for any fuel because the external tanks and the solid ro rocket boost because they've already been ejected on launch. So in order to make sure that they could come back safely, they developed and tested the very first test orbiter of course called constitution yes believe it or not they called it constitution um but despite uh despite that there was a campaign that went on by a well-known television program from the 1960s uh that got its way back to the then president gerald ford who heavily advised nasa to change its name to enterprise so the Enterprise was the first shuttle that was used to do its uh, landing approaches, and they called it ALT, which was Approach and Landing Test. <clears throat> now, these were done in, between February and October 1977, and there were 16 tests in all. Uh, eight of them were just on the back of a jumbo jet, and the other eight was where the orbiter left the jumbo jet and then glided back to Edwards Air Force Base in California. Now, the four men here took it in two-man crew rotation. So you have Fullerton and Hayes over here, and you have Engel and Truly over here. And that is the Fred Hayes from the Apollo 13 days. So yes, they took it in turns. They did two missions or, or did four missions each um, and ended up uh making sure that it was safe to come back so a complete green light after all 16 tests were being done what nasa needed now is because this was a seven-man shuttle they needed to be able to get um recruit crew for it so they went on a recruitment drive and in 1978 35 astronauts were chosen as part of the nasa group Eight, and they were known as the 35 new guys. And these were the ones that were going to be traveling in the shuttle during the 1980s. Some of the names you'll probably recognize. We've got Sally Ride down here, uh, who's probably, uh, probably one of the famous of this bunch. Uh, you've got Resnick, Onizuka, McNair, and Scobie, who unfortunately were all lost in the Challenger disaster. Uh, another name up here, uh, Dick Covey, is uh, he was Capcom for the Challenger disaster. Uh, you probably recognise his face um, when, when we played the, uh, the incident on the TV. Now, the thing about that was, is that because it was a seven-man shuttle, it wasn't just limited to pilots. You could have all different race, religion, sexes. So we had um, the first uh, African-American. We had the first female in space. So it just opened up um, the window. So you had pilots, you had mission specialists, and you had payload specialists who were dedicated, whose dedicated job was to look after the mission in hand rather than fly and land the space shuttle. So the final design of the space shuttle then. <clears throat> Here we go. There we go. Got the space shuttle. Uh, no, that's not the space shuttle despite what everybody thinks, that is the orbiter vehicle. And along with the aforementioned external tank and the solid rocket boosters, all three of those elements together make up what we know as the space shuttle. So let's take all of those elements uh, in, in their uh, singularity. You've got the um, solid rocket boosters here. So they're 150 feet tall and they are 12 feet in diameter. 
That's the first time they've ever used solid rocket boosters, but it made sense to use them because of the concepts that they designed where they had the, the extra push from the solid rocket boosters and then the um, shuttle main engines connected to the fuel tank. So the difference between a normal liquid rocket engine and a solid rocket engine, which is something that uh, Julia mentioned when he was doing his talk on the uh, concepts uh, spaceships, uh, a normal liquid rocket engine has the two fuel, uh, the fuel and the oxidizer. So it's got the propellant in two separate tanks and then a pump here uh, pulls out the uh, propellant, squirts it into the combustion chamber here and then flies it out the back using this uh, converging diverging nozzle or de Lavelle nozzle. Um, and then that's what gives it its thrust. But if you don't want so much thrust, you can turn some of the valves to turn it down, or you could even shut completely and stop some of the propellant um, getting through to the combustion chamber, which means you can turn the engine off. Now, a solid rocket engine has the fuel and the oxidizer together, liquid, uh, uh, solid, in, in this um, upright, it's like a candle really, with a big hole down the middle. Um, and then you've got the igniter. So you ignite it at the top, it burns the fuel on the way down, which pushes the, uh, the flame and the thrust out the back. But once you've lit it, five, six seconds later, you're going somewhere whether you, whether you like it or not. So that's the difference. And that's why a lot of people didn't like it. So here is the um, solid rocket booster. So you've got the, uh, the fuel, the oxidizer and the binder here. With the big channel going up the middle. Um, and so it's 12, 12 feet in diameter. And that diameter was set by rail because they had to cast it in sections, as you can see here. They put it together uh, and they'd ship it in sections to uh, the vehicle assembly lab, uh, so the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and that's to say that 12 foot is set by how big the uh, rail, rail carriage can take it. So here it is all in sections and they're clamped together and be fastened together by these o-rings here so when this section and this section meet there's an o-ring which is just like a rubber ring that you it's a bit more of an industrial one that you have in your plumbing but um yeah it's a rubber ring that would go around and it would create a seal and then as it heats up it would expand and create even more of a seal but i will be coming back to the o-ring uh, a little bit later on so solid rocket boosters, you'd go on to launch, they'd be ejected off the side, they'd be parachuted back down into the ocean and collected by ships, cleaned out and reused again. Now of the 270 solid rocket boosters that went up, 135 missions, two on each, there were only four that failed to come back. One of those, two of those was on STS-4, which was a parachute malfunction, and the other two were on the Challenger disaster where they were uh, detonated by remote control, which was a disability that they could do, and that's the one and only time that they used that. So that's the solid rocket boosters. Um, the external fuel tank, the external fuel tank is the heaviest and the largest part. It's the heaviest when it's loaded, and it's the largest at 150, just over 154 feet, and 27 and a half feet in diameter. Now it's broken up into three parts. We have liquid oxygen at the top, you've got the liquid hydrogen at the bottom, and then you've got a uh, section in the middle that's um, uh, used for um, uh, mounting the solid rocket boosters on. And it was also convenient to put the little mount on the top there for connecting it to the space shuttle. So the Liquid hydrogen at the bottom. The reason why they're uh, two different sizes is because of the different densities of the uh, um, the gases. Um, and the liquid oxygen itself had a little anti vortex baffle on there, so they had to keep it moving. You know, like your ice slushing machine that you get in a shop. They have to keep it turning so that it doesn't uh, it doesn't settle. It's exactly the same sort of principle. Um, so yeah, so that's really just a big a big shell that was. Uh, uh, feeding the uh, 
uh, shuttle main engine with its um, with its fuel to carry on the journey on its way up. So this is where it was connected to the shuttle main engine uh, or to the shuttle, and these were the tubes that would be fed through to the shuttle main engine. <clears throat> these are the first three launches, uh, STS-1 and STS-2 and STS-3, and you can see that on the first two, the external tank was painted pure white. Um, they did that to make it look nice, but then they realised that why are we wasting time and money and weight, which was crucial during the um, uh, space missions, um, painting it white. So from STS-3 onwards, you see its natural burnt orange from its, um, from its process, which is the, uh, the, the outer protection of the, uh, the container itself. Now this particular picture taken by Dave Eagle. Thank you, Dave. You can see it's the main orbiter and it's just had the external tank uh, ejected from it. So if I zoom into that, you can see the color difference. You can see the nice white of the orbiter vehicle and then the orange or the, the duller color of the external tank underneath. Okay, that's a zoomed in version of it. So that's the external tank. So now we've got our, uh, our propellants. So now we'll look at the orbiter vehicle itself. So the orbiter vehicle is 122 feet long and uh, 78 feet along the wingspan. It's made up of three parts. You've got the crew compartment, you've got the payload bay, and you've got the engines at the back, the shuttle engines, uh, the um, orbiter ones and the main engines. Now the crew compartment is made up of three levels. You've got the flight deck at the top where the, uh, the pilot and the commander would sit and uh, you can have two passengers there for launch. So that's where you four seats and you've got three seats down here on the mid deck uh, which is also where your storage and your beds are uh, for sleeping during your mission. You can also store these seats away in the lower deck down at the bottom because that's where all the, uh, the storage was. But it's also where they had the fuel cells because um, the, uh, the shuttle had its own fuel system. These here are uh, the reaction control systems. So then these are little thrusters so they can just do those little minute maneuvers, which is what made the shuttle um, so good at doing all of these missions and, and just fine tuning its position into near satellites and things like that. We've got the uh, the main cargo bay, which, as I said earlier, it's 15 feet wide, it's 60 foot long. Um, uh, it's got the uh, the robotic arm here, made by the Canadian Space Agency, uh, which is 50 foot long. So that's then where you'd be able to grab stuff and uh, move it. And uh, astronauts could even stand on it and manoeuvre around. Um, these doors here, when they open the payload doors, these have got little radiators on there. So because there's lots of heat that would build up within the orbiter, this will radiate all of the heat out so that you don't overload any systems. So that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good radiator for getting rid of all the heat. And then at the front here, you've got the airlock, which you can use to either come out straight into the uh, cargo bay here, like this door here, or you can use the top door, which is used for docking with things like the ISS. So the rockets themselves, you've got two sets of rockets on the back. You've got the uh, shuttle main engine rockets, which are RS-25 engines, and they are dead weight when the, uh, the shuttle is actually reached orbit because they're connected to the uh, external tank. So once that's ejected, that's, that's all its fuel gone. But they are um, they're very reliable and they've had any breakdown, and they're so reliable that they're even being used on the new SLS system, the space launch system that was used on the Orion capsule for the Artemis project. The other set are the OMS, the Orbital Maneuvering System engines, and these are the ones that you use to help you get into orbit once you've launched, or you use it for your deorbit burn to come back to Earth again. Uh, and they are um, uh, AJ-10-190 engines, so not as powerful as the RS-25s, but, but, but they do their 
do their job. Now, the thermal protection system itself is um, silicatized, so it's got like a, a foamy um, under underside with silica on the top. Now, each orbiter has its own individual number of tiles, and they're all numbered as well. So Challenger had the most of 31,088, and Atlantis had uh, around about 25,000. And they had trouble gluing them on in the early stages. They kept falling off, and they ended up having to come up with a, a brand new type of adhesive and a brand new way of putting them on in order to make them stick. It actually caused them more of a headache than than they thought it was going to. They just thought, oh yeah, get some glue, stick it on the bottom, job done. But no, it was more uh, more um, uh, in pain than that. So the fleet itself, this is the fleet itself. So you've got all of your um, uh, Enterprise, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis and Endeavour. Now, the numbers on them, You've got OV101 for the Enterprise and you've got OV099 for Challenger. Now initially, all of the ones starting with one were supposed to have been launched into space. And all of the ones starting with a zero were supposed to have been um, Earth-based ones, non-orbiter-based ones. But when they were testing the Enterprise, um, they expected that to have been launched into space. But then when they built Columbia, there were so many modifications that had to have been done on it. Um, they, it was too expensive to do on the Enterprise. So that then remained the test vehicle and it was cheaper to upgrade what, their, what was then their structural test model that they used to wind tunnels and all sorts of stuff like that on it. Um, and that's how the 099 ended up going into space because it was cheaper to upgrade that one to the changes that Columbia had made. So unfortunately, we lost Columbia and Challenger, um, but uh, the others are still on display. The Enterprise is at the, uh, the Intrepid Air Museum in New York. You've got the Discovery that's at the Smithsonian uh, in, what, in um, uh, Washington. You've got the uh, Endeavour, which is at the uh, Science Center in California. And then you've got the Atlantis, which was the last one, and that's at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, visitors complex, which uh, Dave Eagle was very um, uh, uh, pleased to send me some pictures so that I could show you of actually there when he visited. Uh, and it was, a, a, I imagine, an amazing day out. I've not been, but it's certainly on my bucket list. But some things keep happening every time I want to go in this particular time. It's COVID. So, yes, it's on my bucket list to do. So, the very first shuttle itself, that was. Yes, one. It took off on the 12th of April 1981, and it was on the 20th anniversary of the first human space flight. It wasn't supposed to have been. It was supposed to have been on the 10th of April, but because of some computer issues that it took them a day or so to sort out, um, it just happened to be on that day. It wasn't pre-planned. It was the first human vehicle to be manned on its maiden flight into space. So the Mercury's, the Apollo's, the Gemini's. And even the uh, the Crew Dragon have all had test flights unmanned. So this was the first time that they've ever done that. First use of solid rocket boosters, as I mentioned earlier. People never used to like them because you can't shut them off. But it made sense on the design of the space shuttle. And on launching it with uh, Bob Crippen, John Young became the first to fly four different classes of spacecraft. The Gemini, the Apollo Command Service Module, the Apollo Lander, and the space shuttle and um, I still believe he is the only person to have done that. I have tried to look for somebody else so if somebody does find somebody then please do let me know um, but at the moment I, he's the only one that I've come up with that. So the highlights in the early stages you had the first four STS-1 to STS-4 they were in Columbia and they were all a two-man crew because they were the research and development missions. Um, from STS-5, it was um, upgraded to a four-man crew, and then from STS-6 to STS-8, um, that, that included, that was the Challenger, and uh, one of those flights included uh, Sally Ride, the first American woman into space. Uh, and then it was back to Columbia for Space Lab for STS-9. 
So the numbering system was pretty straightforward. It ran from STS1 to STS9. And then it started to get a bit weird. We ended up with STS 41B, STS 51G, STS 61C. What's going on here, you ask? Well, these are the missions that ran from number 10 onwards. You can see that we've introduced some new orbiters. Um, so the reason for it was to allow for these increase in orbiters and the flights um, because they were supposed to be ramped up. We wanted to do uh, in its early stages 150 flights a year. Now that's quite a lot. Um, but as you can see, in 1985, they had a whole string of them. So it, it, it was starting to get there. And it also, they wanted to use Vandenberg Air Force Base. Now, Kennedy Space Center is fine unless you want to send something to polar orbit because you can't get the right angle to get up to polar orbit. But from the other side in California, from Vandenberg, you can go straight down and do a polar orbit from there without having to fly over any land to get rid of your um, solid rocket boosters, your external tank, or if anything went wrong on the flight. So that was the reason why they did that. Um, so the STS stood for Space Transportation System. That makes sense. Then it gets a little bit more complicated. The next number is the fiscal year that the mission was created. Now NASA's financial year ran from October to September. So something that was launched in 2004 had a four on it. But then this particular one had a five on it, even though it was launched in 1994, because it was after October the 1st, which means it was into 2005's financial year. You with me so far? Now, the next number on the end the one or the two means one was going from Kennedy Space Center and two was going from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Now, the last letter is the order in which that mission was chosen in that financial year. So, even though STS 51A, STS 51B flew before. STS or after STS 51B, it's because it was chosen before it to fly. So once it's designated its mission number, it then stayed no matter what. So that doesn't sound as complicated now that you've seen it, but that's how it all changed because they wanted to put as much information within the mission number as they possibly could until, unfortunately, Challenger STS 51L had to put the brakes on everything and took another look at the shuttle program as a whole. And after that, they went back to their original numbering system of the STS, the one they started at 26, because the mission after Challenger was number 26, and then on to 27 and 28. So that's why you've got those unusual numbering systems in the middle of the um, uh, early part of the shuttle program. So launching the shuttle then. So it's assembled in the vehicle assembly building like a lot of things are because it's, it's a huge building that can take on quite an astounding um, uh, uh, complex constructions of these things. So it was then rolled out from there on this thing, which is a crawler. And the crawler itself only goes at two miles an hour. And the trip is six hours from the, from the uh, vehicle assembly building the launch pad itself and these crawlers over the years have taken something like 300 missions from the Saturn V uh, to the early Apollo 4 mission through the Apollo days and right up to the last STS 135 shuttle mission so yeah it's quite a trek um, but does anybody or can anybody think of the difference between the space shuttle crawler and the Saturn V crawler? The answer is the space shuttle crawler didn't took the space shuttle to the launch pad, whereas the Saturn V took the launch pad with it to the launch site. And the, the reason for that is purely because of size. The vehicle assembly building could assemble it, this massive Saturn V rocket but that'd be difficult to get it to attach 
to the launch tower when they got there. So they did it in the vehicle assembly building while they had the facilities. And obviously the space shuttle being a lot smaller, they were able to just build um, walkways, which is what they've got now for the Crew Dragon. Uh, of course, you've got a little dinghy pack on the top there that it prevents the liquid oxygen and all of that. And then that disappears just before they go on to launch. So that's how they rolled it out to the, uh, the pad. The launch itself, so the first thing it would do is that it would clear the tower, then it would go into its roll program once it's lifted off. And just over two minutes in, you'd eject the solid rocket boosters that would come down by parachute into the ocean. And then the external tank would come off for about eight and a half, eight and a half minutes. And then you'd use the um, the ohms, the orbital uh, maneuvering uh, engines to get you into low Earth orbit. So that's how we would uh, get up, how we would launch the shuttle. And then I've got when a shuttle launches go wrong, there was the challenge of the disaster, which I've uh, already mentioned. Um, the story behind it was back in 1984, the space shuttle program was getting a bit boring, a bit routine. So Ronald Reagan wanted to um, uh, inject a bit of life into it and announced that they would be sending the first citizens into space. And he chose a teacher. So 11,000 people applied, and there were two candidates that fall from each state that were then going through to the finals. And in 1985, Krista McCullough was chosen as the first candidate. And then there was a backup teacher called Barbara, Barbara Morgan, who was also chosen. Now, after many delays on the actual day itself, the flight finally did go off on a cold January morning. Lift on. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance three nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. There's probably some of this here we'll remember seeing that back in the uh, uh, back in this time. So the problem. When they, when they analyzed it, was that there was a leak in the solid rocket booster and it came back to these O rings that they burnt through. And when it was cold, they, it was more susceptible, they were less, they were less um, uh, elastic uh, and uh, it allowed some of the um, propellant to come out and, uh, yes, unfortunately, um, go up. The frustrating thing is, is that NASA knew about these ovens. They knew that there was a problem. They, they'd seen it already in earlier shuttle missions. Um, the manufacturers, Firepole, who was in Huntsville, they knew about it as well. And they were even having conversations on the morning of the particular Challenger flight because it was so cold and they knew that cold was going to cause it a problem. But they went ahead with it. They grounded the uh, fleet for three years. And um, the problems were fixed, uh, mainly as a, a, a double O ring on each section, but then there were other upgrades in that done. But we were back September the 29th, 1988, when we had gone back to the original numbering system of STS 26. And taking us there was this uh, Dick Covey, who I mentioned before, and also 
the uh, Discovery Shuttle, who, in my opinion, is the best shuttle in the fleet, the most reliable shuttle in the fleet. So we're back. So what were some of the things that the shuttle actually did? Well, it launched the Hubble in April 1990 on this TM31, which is the 35th mission. Uh, some of us will probably remember that. And probably some of us remember it having to be repaired as well, so that when it was, um, they tried to take some pictures of it, they realised that the mirror wasn't actually quite right and they needed to give it a, basically a pair of, pair of glasses. So in 1993, SDS-61 spent 11 days, the crew did, upgrading, servicing and fixing the Hubble telescope. Uh, it also launched the ISS. So the, um, the first part of the ISS was sent up by the Russians with a proton rocket in November 1998. And um, the Americans followed with their version or their Unity module two weeks later. Uh, and because of the, uh, the arm of the space station, uh, the, the space shuttle was able to easily put the two pieces together. Uh, it also the first female commander of the space shuttle as well. So Eileen Collins, who's um, sort of a hero of mine, she uh, she was uh, became an astronaut in 1990. She did. She was the first space shuttle pilot in 1995, who you can see on STS-63. Uh, she also piloted this one uh, in STS-84, and then she was the commander of STS-93 here that launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory into space. So yes, and she did a fourth mission as well, which I'll come into a little bit later. So landing the shuttle. The shuttle would normally, what would be upside down. That way the heat from the sun would be onto the thermal protection system, um, keeping the crew and all of the cargo and everything safe. Um, it could normally be traveling in this number two configuration, so anything that's uh, debris that's flying around would, um, would uh, harmlessly not, not hurt the crew. Uh, but if they were traveling in this, then they would spin around. They'd, they'd use their uh, Ohm's engines to flip it over to an angle of 40 degrees, and that would be their angle of attack into the atmosphere, coming in at 40 degrees. Um, so that would give them enough drag to be able to slow down, but not, not fully. So as they're coming in at 40 degrees, they'd have to do the series of S-bends that would then slow the shuttle down a little bit further as it, as it came into um, the American coast. And then rather than the plane, would it come in with wheels down, it would come in nose down. And then at the last minute, it would bring its nose up to then land down because it's gliding in. It's not using any engines, remember. So that's how it would land. It would either land at Edwards Air Force Base, but its primary landing site would be the Kennedy Space Center. But if the weather wasn't allowed or the weather was poor, it would land at Edwards Air Force Base and then they'd have to stick it onto the back of a jumbo jet and take it back to Kennedy Space Center, which is quite a, quite a long flight, quite an expensive flight of four or five fuel, fuel tanks or fuel loads that have to be done for it. Um, the other option is the White Sands Space Harbour, if either of these two are out of action, and it only ever had to land there once. SDS-4 landed there um, when this Kennedy Space Center weren't ready in the early days, and the Edwards Air Force Base was flooded. So it landed at White Sands. Now, this is when a landing went wrong. Unfortunately, a lot of people just remember this one as well, STS-107 on launch, it was hit by a piece of foam that came off the external tank and struck the wing. Um, now, at the time, it was um, standard practice for NASA just to re-look re at the footage, and they saw this, but they didn't think it was going to be um, too much of an issue for them. So they didn't even tell the crew. Um, but then when the crew came back on the 1st of February 2003, it disintegrated in the atmosphere and it had obviously um, penetrated the heat shield so that it had struck it right there and cracked it and allowed the heat to get into the heat shield which ultimately then um, destroyed the shuttle on its way in. 
There are lots of tributes that were done for Columbia. There was Spirit Rover's landing site, which is on Mars, the Columbia Memorial site, the seven asteroids in the asteroid belt that are named after the crew. And at the Kennedy Space Center, um, they've opened up a memorial exhibit for both the Challenger and the Columbia crew for all the missions, which I'm sure Dave must have seen while he was out there. But we returned again. STS-114 this time after the uh, uh, Columbia disaster. It was on the July the 26th, 2005. My favourite shuttle, Discovery. And who was at the command? It was Eileen Collins. Unfortunately, it was too little too late. Because the Columbia Accident Investigation Bureau was, it, it was kind of, that was it for, for the shuttle. And in January 2004, um, President Bush made some announcements during a, a speech that the shuttle was now an aging system, but still developmental in character. It's in the interest to replace the shuttle as soon as possible. They finished what they started by completing the ISS by 2010, but then after 30 years of duty, the shuttle will be retired. He did unveil um, a new foothold on preparation for NASA to go to the moon and beyond, which was the Constellation. I don't know if you remember that program. Um, but yeah, um, it was uh, unveiled. It was uh, come out of service to be decommissioned after the International Space Station was finished. So the new rules came in as part of the, uh, the CAIB, or the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. Um, every mission was treated as a return to flights. Every element, every piece of detail was scrutinized, which was kind of going against what the shuttle was um, designed to do. They wanted to make it uh, flowing so that they could get lots and lots of missions out of it. The shuttle's external tank was redesigned um, to stop um, excessive foam building off it. Astronauts used cameras in the robotic arm to scan the belly, so where it was originally 50 feet, they extended it so they were able to get a camera underneath to be able to take pictures for themselves. Um, they had more cameras uh, on launch, so they could look for foam shedding, and it could do a belly flip when it goes up to the ISS so that the people can be able to visual, visual, it, visual it itself to have a look to see if there's any damage. Uh, and the International Space Station was classed as a safe haven because that's what they wanted to do was the International Space Station. So they wouldn't let any other um, type of mission go on so that it could be used as a safe haven should anything happen. A couple of missions after Columbia that I just want to highlight. This one here is uh, STS-118, which was in Geva back in August 2007. It was struck by some debris, as you can see here, caused a bit of a media frenzy. Um, but thankfully, as you can see there, it didn't penetrate into the, uh, the, uh, the hull of the spacecraft. So it was only um, deemed okay to come back. Um, but it was also captured on camera by Mr. Dave Eagle. Yes, he managed to capture the STS-118 in flight. And I did promise him that I would be telling about the significance of one of his photos. And it's this one. If you look at some of the names around here, you can see you've got Kelly. There was none other than Scott Kelly, who did the year in space. He was on the International Space Station at the same time as Tim Peake. And we've also got here Morgan, who was none other than Barbara Morgan, who was the backup teacher for Christopher McCauley. And this was her one and only flight. So when Dave sent me this photo and I realised what it was, I was actually quite excited at what he captured, and I don't think he realised either. So uh, yes, very, very quite good photo. The only exception to going to the ISS was this one, STS-125, um, which was uh, to upgrade Hubble. Now, it was originally cancelled back in 2004 um, for the concerns of the, the um, Columbia outcome because it wasn't being able to go to the ISS. But in 2006, the mission was reinstated, and in 2009, they upgraded to Hubble for the very last time to give us the wonderful pictures that we've got now. So the last flight was STS-135 and it launched on the 8th of July 2011 and there it is, it's landing there, it's the uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis. 
And Dave Eagle managed to capture that uh, transit of the sun on its way out. Again, that's another amazing picture. Again, I'll ask him afterwards how he managed to get that. Just, uh, yeah, very, very good picture. That. Thanks for that, Dave. So SPS 135, it was the final, the 130th and final mission. So it launched on the 8th of July 2011, and it was only a four-person crew, which was the smallest since the early days of SPS 6, which I told you about during the, uh, the research and development. Um, it carried a flag. It was also carried on SPS 1. It was delivered to the International Space Station to be collected by the next crew that went there. And Doug Hurley, if I go back here, Hurley, this is Doug Hurley. He delivered it to the ISS and he also went and collected it on the Crew Dragon Demo 2 um, in June last year, which we watched live as part of the uh, Virtual Astronomy Club and Go Space Watch um, program. So yes, and it landed on the 21st of July, 2011, and the shuttle program was over. Having fired the imagination of a generation, a ship like no other, its place in history secured, the space shuttle pulls into port for the last time, its voyage at an end. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. And there it is, the end of an era. Now, was it worth it? Is the next question, because there are people who would say we wasted 30 years of trying to develop technology to get to Mars. We also ended up, because of the space shuttle, having 10 years of America not being able to fly to the International Space Station. Well, I'm in that, yes, it was worth it camp. And that's because at the time, NASA needed to do something, and it allowed them to continue the space program at a time when. The Americans were in real financial trouble. They had a lot going on. It's a really impressive feat of engineering what they managed to produce. And it allowed a more diverse crew selection, not just people that were either pilots or commanders. It allowed uh, scientists to go up and do what scientists do firsthand. It saved Hubble. We'd have probably been able to launch Hubble without the uh, space station. But there's no way we could have now to fix it. It helped to launch, it helped launch and assemble the ISS. Again, we could have probably done it, but with the crew arm, but, but sorry, the, the arm, the robotic arm that was on it, it made things so much easier. And it developed scientific advancements that helped us on Earth, mainly in the aerospace industry, but it still did it. So I thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed the history of the space shuttle. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. Excellent talk. Brings it all back. So, uh, yeah. Amazing. Amazing technology. And uh, yes, because um, as well as Hubble, it launched lots of other satellites as well, didn't it? And it actually went up and captured a couple that were in the wrong orbit and brought them back. It did, yeah. There was one particular one that uh, they had to, to to stop from entering. In fact, when they went to first try and capture it, um, they nearly knocked it back into low Earth orbit and sent it into a better spin. But they had to strategically get underneath it. And there was two men physically on the back of the space shuttle holding on to this satellite, uh, manhandling it in space. And that's just amazing. It launched Galileo as well, if anybody remembers that, that went to Jupiter. Um, Okay, we can launch them now, but we end up with debris, rocket bodies, rocket bearings, and all sorts of stuff in space. All of this lot came down, the whole lot came back down again. Two parts of it were reused, and the other one sat in the ocean and degrade over time. So there's no um, uh, space debris up there, or less space debris because of the space shuttle. Yeah. Um, Anybody got any questions? Philip, let me... Uh... Or, or any memories. Any you memories, any memories of it? Of course. I've, I've got memories. I, I don't quite, but that, that was an excellent talk that you gave, Bob. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I have lots of memories of the shuttle programme, having watched it, you know, from the right through, really, you know. 
Uh, I think the the the, the, the shuttle was uh, it was a, tre a tremendous thing, you know. It, it was never used to its full capability, and the problem with it, it was a lot more expensive than what they thought it was going to be, you know. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was originally there was going to be a fleet of 20 orbiters and it was supposed to be a turnaround period of about one to two weeks between missions. Mm. Uh, that's that's the 150 uh, yeah. Rockwell was going to set up a production line in, in Downey, California to build these spaceships. The problem was that the OMB, the American Office of Management and Budget, they they wanted to cancel the shuttle. No, they weren't, you know. And Gerald Ford refused point blankly. And Gerald Ford wasn't a great space president, you know, he wasn't really into it. But Carter wanted the whole thing cancelled. And we had to fight to save the shuttle. And the amount of cuts and all the rest of the Carter administration meant that it collapsed out of about four orbiters, I think. And Rockwell said, well, if that's the case, then we're going to have to, we won't be having a production line like what the Russian had for Soyuz. So we're going to have to hand build these things. And of course, what that meant was that the prices went through the roof, you know, basically. Uh, a, it's like compared to your media Speedmaster watch with a cheap watch that you could buy for five pounds. It's mass produced. You've got you've got to handcraft the thing, you know. Uh, and then of course they had technical issues because it was a difficult thing to do, you know. And and I remember watching on the BBC the first flight in 1981. I met most of these astronauts that, that you've actually mentioned there. Uh, I met Eileen Collins several times. I had my dinner with her, you know. Uh, she was in the UK when I had her in Pontefract a few years back. That's uh, and the last time I was over at the Space Centre, I met Barbara Morgan, and that was just uh, amazing, you know. I mean, following it here on the TV, and I, you, the, the first flight, the BBC and ITN did live coverage, and I think ITN, they were way ahead of the BBC. Uh, this, by the time we got to the third flight, uh, both the BBC and ITN had dropped it, and we were reduced to live coverage on Radio 2. Uh, but but they, 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 in the 80s, both the BBC and ITV gave it a lot of coverage of news, and I bought a video recorder, it was the most expensive thing I'd ever did for the first flight in April 81. And I've got a huge collection of tapes and stuff, and that's how I started recording. Uh, you mentioned the STS 9, which was about that was the first space flight mission, it's first, first space lab mission. And of course, and that was John Young again, and that one flew over the UK. And I remember it being on TV AM, I think it was, in the, and the actual, the, the best place to be was Dundee, where it would appear overhead. But at that time, I, I work in the observatory in Dundee, but I am original from the Glasgow, you know. And at that time, I was living in Paisley. And I was working in, some of you down south might have heard of Macro, you know, cash and carry uh, people. And I was working for Macro, and we saw the shuttle fly over Glasgow. And the external tank had just separated, you know, and, it, and they both went across the, 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 the sky, you know. Uh, and that was amazing to see that, you know. And I, I did manage to get over to, uh, I, I think I've been over to the Space Centre about seven or eight times now, but that's over a long period of 30 years. And I did manage to see Endeavour and the, you know, I said at the beginning, I saw, I did, I saw one was a day launch, and the, the other one was a night launch, mm. which was really spectacular. Uh, the the Challenger was the worst thing in my life. It was awful. I I, I missed that. Well, it wasn't live. Or in America, it was on CNN. And the problem in 86 is we didn't have the internet like you've got today, you no. know. And it was difficult to uh, find out what was going on. There was a magazine called, some of you might remember, Space Flight News. I'm a yeah. member of the British Interplanetary Society, so they had a space flight magazine. Yeah. And there were problems with the door on the shuttle, and that delayed the launch. And I, I thought that they, I thought, well, they're going, it was on the news, they're going to have to recycle the tank, it's going to be 48 hours. So I actually wasn't expecting a launch on the, the morning of the 28th of January. 
oh, but when I'm coming home from a walk, I was in the house about 10 minutes. Yeah. Phone they, bought, they bought some power tools up and fixed it, didn't they? Which isn't the, 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 the best thing to do, but they managed to get it done in time. So that was... Uh, yeah, I know. So the, yeah. uh, the, uh, I just see that there's some Aaron, questions yeah. come on about people saying that there were other sites around the world. Yes, I believe there was. I think there was one in Scotland and one of the ones yes. that they're promoting to be the... Um, uh, uh, one of the Scottish sites that they're using yeah, to launch. Had, it. You yeah, had, it yeah. had the it had the Vandenberg went ahead. RAF Macrahanish in Scotland, which was the longest runway in the UK, mm -hmm. we just been an emergency yeah. landing site. Mm -hmm. But somebody put in the comments that RAF Bryce Norton was also yeah. an emergency landing site. Yeah, and, yeah there, um, there was there was one launch that was put into a more northerly orbit than normal. And that was amazing to go over because I didn't think we were going to see it from here after launch. But the um, fuel tank was absolutely incredible because the sun was behind the tank. You could see all the fuel that was spilling out of it around the mm. tank as it was rotating. It was fantastic to see. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Russ asked about STS-1 and the underbelly. No, they didn't take any pictures of the underbelly. In fact, when STS-1 came back, they were surprised to see that some of the tiles had come off the back. Um, thankfully, that it hadn't done the, it hadn't done it on the heat shield, but on the back of the uh, the orbital near where the, um, the the fin is, they could see that. Uh, but of course, they couldn't see underneath because they didn't have any cameras. They weren't in any range of anything, and the arm wasn't long enough to take so many pictures underneath. So they were a little bit concerned because um, they didn't know what would come off underneath, but they couldn't do anything about it. Um, but no, they hadn't taken any pictures of the underbelly for STS-1. I'm just scrolling through to see if there's any other questions. That any, I know other, any other questions, if anybody wants to unmute? I was just going to make a quick comment, Dave. Um, <laughs> towards the end, of course, the whole of the shuttle support equipment was basically obsolete. They were actually going out buying second-hand IBM computer disk drives from flea markets in the States to keep the thing running. So it was really in the stage where it wasn't just the shuttle was a problem, it was needed a complete re-engineer by then to, if they tried to keep it going. The, the shuttle should have been replaced back in the 1990s, but it yeah. was, and that's a whole other story. But yeah. I do remember getting the thing from NASA asking for a computer part, so 3xx computers. Just because it's old, it doesn't mean you see it, that it can't work and do the job. And we had the, the Glasgow subway, which was built in 1896, and these trains were still operating in the 70s. And uh, they had to cannibalise, it's a bit like the space shuttle, they cannibalised other trains to get bits to keep them running. And when the trams went off in 62, they cannibalised the bogies off the tram cars to keep the trains running. But they did the job until we got money to modernise it. Yeah, as long as they get the job done, it's... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Well, various Airbuses, of course, still use three and a half inch floppy disks to upload yes. the yep. information to uh, them. That's right. I think the, the, the Boeing 7, the, the 747 Jumble Jet used the plastic floppy disks, I believe, mm. still using that. The other thing I was going to say, if you're interested, it's worth reading Richard Feynman's report into yes. the, is he was part of the investigation. Um, panel when the um, rocket blew up and he was the one who was actually set up to demonstrate in the press conference that the o-rings became inflexible and broke yeah. at cold temperatures he had a section of o-ring and he put it in a glass of water on the with icing on the um conference table the press yeah. conference table and then pulled it out and broke it and said something like yeah. i think this had something to do with the cause yeah, well, he I, that's exactly. I, he he was the guy that yeah. found the cause, the brittle O-ring because of the cold, and that was exactly the engineers at Morton Poikel told NASA not to launch, mm. and they were overruled by their management and NASA's management, and they went ahead regardless. But but Feynman, was, but he solved it, you know. I don't know if he solved it. I think he, he, he found I think he was actually. I think he was set up to be the person who could say that without everyone jumping on top of him because he was a Nobel Prize he, and he was a rather, I don't know what sort of you describe his character as, but he wasn't yeah. a person that would, um, was afraid of telling what he thought was the truth. Yeah. 
Well, he had the idea suggested to him, didn't he? And yeah. as I say, yeah. as you said, it was um, it was him that came up with it or, or came out with it because yes. he was more believable because of his status than um, somebody else. Yes, it's well so, worth reading if you find a copy of it. Right, there was a flight of Atlantis in 1985, I believe, but that had it had the Challenger and Columbia disasters that had both the same things. The O-ring gave away, but fortunately it was on the other side from the external tank and pieces of foam and all the rest from the, the external tank fell on the orbiter. And Atlantis came back and it was in an awful state when it came back to Florida. It had survived, you know. And I think that was, in the end, why they, they got rid of the shuttle basically was these were the, the design, what's the word, the elements that they just simply didn't know about. And I think you had to realise it was just too risky, you know, uh, unfortunately, carrying on. There was other bits going wrong with it, things, things that it's, it's like when you've got a car for so long, it can only run for so long before you have to upgrade it. And it just cost so much to upgrade that they had to decommission it. And it was supposed to come up with something else before, but my 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 feeling is where they failed is between they made that announcement in 2004 decommissioned it in 2011 and they had no backup they produced nothing else in that seven year period and that, that that's where i felt well they, 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 well the the, the the plan was that they were going to the, the, the replacement is actually a rhyme you know Oh, but the, the, the problem then was that, that there would have been a, 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 a slight gap, but President Obama cancelled the space programme, basically. Uh, and and that, that extended the gap, you know. They were going on for the commercial crew as well, you know. Uh, but with Orion being can Constellation being cancelled and thousands of workers thrown on the door, now obviously that increased the, you know, the, the gap that made it a, a lot worse. Bill, just a couple of things from Mayfield, if I can. Okay. Yeah, go on, Mike. Yeah, um, I was fortunate to be uh, in Florida for the launch of uh, STS-61 in December 93 for the uh, first Hubble service mission. That was um, the first and only time I saw the launch of the shuttle. That was absolutely fantastic uh, experience to have. Um, I went back in, um, the last time I went back was 2018 and saw a uh, shuttle in the Museum at Antis, of course. Um, you know, brought back memories, of course, of the 93 visit. But what you said, um, uh, Phil, about the shuttle main engines uh, being so, so reliable, um, and uh, they're going to be used on the uh, SMS system. Uh, we saw the test of the uh, SMS um, tank uh, only this year. Uh, unfortunately, they're not going to be reused again because uh, the, uh, the, the the SLS main tank is going to be thrown away, uh, as was the first stage of the Saturn V in the past. Oh, so no. that's the uh, that's the unfortunate thing about those. So they'll have to come up with something else to replace them in for replace them for future flights. Yeah. So they've only got enough for three. F I think it's three SLS flights. Uh, with the engines that they've got so far, they put they put in an order for ten SLS rockets, and okay. the, uh, the RS twenty five is going back into production. Okay, so what, what they've got is I can't remember the figure. There was about sixteen engines left over from yeah. the shuttle program. The reason uh, why it's not reusable is to make it reusable. That's going to cost a hell of a lot more of money. It's going to cost it would cost billions more, and it would add more delay. Uh, and it yep. the issues and all the rest of it. The solid rocket boosters on SLS are only going to be one use as well, whereas yep. in the shuttle we reuse them. But basically what happened was that when they came back on the shuttle, they were just like burnt out fireworks and they had to scoop all the, the, the stuff out and re repack it again. So it's cheaper actually just to just to use or uh, you know the the the, the, the SR, a new set basically, you know. I mean, but obviously Elon Musk is going ahead with Starship, which is new technology and all the rest of it, and the Falcon 9, and these are both uh, amazing things. They are not new. In fact, it was the UK, it was the British, it was us in the 60s, I think we got one, you know, that came up with reusable rockets. It, it, it just took uh, a long time to develop that. 
that for going to the moon, the, the SLS, you know, it makes a lot, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the cheaper way to do it, basically. Mm -hmm. It sounds, uh, and like all space projects, they are very, including the shuttle, it was very expensive in the research and development phase, billions. But once you get in, uh, and the same with Apollo, but once you get into an operational phase, the costs come down. Yeah. So that's what I have a question in planet. the chat there, Phil. Oh, what was the longest reuse time for a single shuttle main engine? I think we just answered that because it was it, it it kept running and running and running. They bring it back, they resurface it, and they they never had to replace any of them. Right. Which is why I'm surprised when they said about the RS twenty fives that they that they wouldn't reuse them for the FLS because it would make sense to such a reliable engine and it was proven so on the uh, on the space shuttle. I don't know how many. I I I, I, don't, I think they had a limited lifetime of the amount of flights that you could use. I don't think you, they, 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 I don't think they've all all the the ones that they made still exist. You know, I think these engines were parts of the oh, that they every, every engine will run out eventually, but this yeah. got to the point where it just kept running and running and running. Yeah, mm -hmm. on, on the SLS, on the SLS, they're going to end up in the ocean, aren't they? Yeah, that's, that's what um, good. Yeah, that's what Michael yeah. was saying. What's, what's hot, the point? Very hot engines chucked into the cold seawater. It doesn't sound like a good combination. Mm. <laughs> that's, how, that's, how, that's how you get to the moon. That's how we got to the moon. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And the shuttle tank ended up in the sea as well. Well, yeah. mm. all the Saturn V's are still, uh, main stages are still on Earth somewhere. Well, yeah. Under the sea, at least. Under the sea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other questions for Phil? Well, we all uh, just wanted off. to say, Phil, will NASA be calling uh, any other vehicles with the letter C can, after the Challenger and the Columbia disasters? I was going to mention that at the time when I was putting the uh, fleet up, because <laughs> yeah. they were the only two beginning with C, and they were the unfortunate casualties. So mm. We don't want a third time unlucky. No. Well, I'd like no. to think that the Crew Dragon is actually just going to be called the Dragon. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll, we'll yeah, stick with that for now. The crew, the crew dragon capsules have all got names. One's Endeavour, and then the other one was, well, what's the, I forget the name of it, Resilience. Yeah, Resilience. Yeah. Yeah. So the Elon has given them names. Yeah. And they're reusable like the shuttle, yeah. but I think well, they, they can only be reused about four or five times, but they are reusable. That's it, yeah. Yeah. But that's more to do with the heat shield rather than the engines, yeah. that one, because you can only uh, apply it so many times. Because the old ones used to be ablative, which means you couldn't reuse them at all. But this one uses a uh, the uh, Crew Dragon uses a very similar concept to the shuttle, where it's tiles that are on yeah. the bottom, but they're uh, a more lightweight, cheaper version called Pika X. Um, so it's a very similar concept, but that, that they don't have the same longevity than the space shuttle so yeah four or five times and then they'd have to redo another one but it's only a capsule it's not like they're rebuilding an entire shuttle because the shuttle was just a basically it was a space plane yeah but the, the, the shuttle... any, other, any other questions before we go no okay well thanks so much phil Excellent, oh, bringing it all, all the uh, excitement of the shuttle and its achievements yep. back to us all. So thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic. So last meeting before summer is a couple of weeks time. So set it in your diary and don't forget to put your name down for a reminder email if you haven't done that already from the uh, VAC webpage. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. So get your glasses charged and uh, come in. And hopefully we have lots of fun on our last one before the summer. So uh, take care, folks. Right. Before Thanks, I go, Thanks, you know what Bill. I'm going to say? See you all. Keep safe. Thanks, keep well. Thanks, and keep looking, keep looking up. up. Yeah. Take care. Bye, folks. Bye. -bye.